The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Recreational marijuana is now legal in 10 states while medical marijuana is legal in 34. Beta remain optimistic of the legalization of recreational use of marijuana in New York State. But with the lucrative wealth possibilities in the cannabis industry, black and people of color may have a disadvantage in benefiting from the financial and economic prosperities. Stay tuned to find out how a group of individuals are making sure that minorities are educated, informed, and prepared for the mainstream cannabis culture soon to come. That's up next on Perspectives with yours truly, Darren Hyman. What's on your mind? Let him know. What's on your mind? Let him know. Anything relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you make a move solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, you speak on your decisions. Cause in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective which shines a light. Cause it might make a difference in someone else's life. What's your perspective? New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo had plans to legalize marijuana in New York, but the proposal was dropped from the recent state budget, mainly because lawmakers say his proposal could further perpetuate the ongoing racial inequality already enforced by current drug laws. Other objectives was that black and people of color would not benefit from economic and business value of the legalization. Earlier in March, the New York City Council called for all misdemeanor marijuana convictions to be expunged and for the state legislature to pass legislation fully legalizing, regulating, and taxing the drug. Now, many advocates say that most proposals still fall short in ensuring that black communities benefit and are not marginalized with the legalization of marijuana. Now, joining me now is someone who is on the front line of ensuring that equality and equity is a part of the cannabis conversation for blacks and of people of color. She's a cannabis marketer, as well as co-founder of Canaclusive. We're pleased to know that she's a graduate of the University of Michigan. Whoop, whoop, has been a strong blow. advocate and lobbyist of teaching people how to, of color how to invest in cannabis, as well as the medical and health benefits that she personally can testify to. We welcome now Mary Pryor, who's co-founder of Canaclusive and president of the New York chapter of Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Mary, good to have you. Thank you very much, Darren. I, I appreciate it. I caught that whoop whoop about Michigan. Yes, of course. We're a very, very amazing school. Someone earlier tried to mess me up uh -huh. and put Michigan State in my bio. Had to fix that immediately. Very quickly, huh? Not a game. I'm from Detroit, too, so you know we don't play around. Oh, Lord. Well, let's get right at it. Let's talk about it here. Talk about the cannabis industry. Obviously, we talked about the governor and... Uh, he's saying that, well, first, the, the legislator is saying we're not putting it in the budget this no, time around. No, right. Right. You, give me your thoughts on that first. I mean, to be honest with you, it, it was a very ambitious goal. I think doing it in the first 100 days was something as part of, like, the governor's justice agenda was, you know, a, a good considerable push. Um, I think that the conversation on cannabis now is in a totally different place than where it was even a year ago. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, that's good. I do think that considering how big equity needs to be put into this bill, June isn't a horrible push off. And if June is where it needs to be, June is where it needs to be. But there's no way, and I can give examples of different states and different cities that are struggling right now with how they did not have equity at the forefront. There's no way to make this a delayed situation. If we delay this, given what's happening federally and how things are ramping up, equity will not be part of anything that's coming across. Mm -hmm. So we have to make it a bit priority and keep pressure on our elected officials to make this an item and to bring it into more homes and more discussions, whether it's to clergy members, whether it's to people within Caribbean communities, immigrants, anyone who's in this city and especially upstate, West New York, East New York, overall, we have to be more open and honest about how much we can really benefit from, from using this as medicine versus viewing it as a drug. So we talk about equity. How do you define equity? Equity, honestly, I'll prove it this way. Diversity is where you say, hey, we should invite people to the party. 
inclusion is where they're already at the table, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about equity, it's not really a matter of what I've heard people say is like, you know, a dream idea of fixing reparations. That's not what it is. It's not a dream concept of an idea of creating imbalance. Like, racism will always exist. It's been here before, it'll be here after. So equity doesn't fix that problem. But what it does address is this, is that you have people selling cannabis, marijuana, weed, loud, whatever you want to call it, out legally and making millions to close to billions of dollars with it. Meanwhile, people that look like you and me, melanated human beings, are in jail due to the war on drugs, and our communities have been harmed by all of that. Now, this isn't a conspiracy theory. We are very aware that drugs were plugged into our communities, pumped into our communities, in order to create stagnation within our communities. That is a fact. That's all part of, of American history. So with that going on, on top of the fact that reefer madness in 1937 and the prohibition of that during that year, which was created as a campaign against material science because they were worried about hemp replacing plastics and cotton, and it was a war to be able to marginalize and put away and put racism, racism and stereotypes towards melanated bodies, mostly Mexican immigrants and black people. So when we talk so about- All of that was just created as a way to remove use of the plant, which was part of pharmacology for hundreds of years within the United States already. Mm -hmm. And it's an indigenous plant. So equity is pretty much putting the things back in place so that people have a chance to actually be at this table and shape it the way it needs to be. You got millions of people already incarcerated for marijuana-related offenses. Exactly. How do we see this playing out in terms of expungement? Do you think that that's going to be the full, that's going to be the full, for New York, part of full Well, for New York State, only vacation is available according to the Constitution and the bylaws within the state. Vacating a record means stealing a record. That allows for other items such as discrimination to take place in the hiring process, which sucks, but that's a reality, right? Mm -hmm. But currently within New York State, you can vacate records. That's what's currently being advocated across the board from the bill, from a policy perspective. Other states have expungement. New York State can only vacate. Uh, yes, expungement would be ideal. That's something that would completely need to change the entire framework of the Constitution, which still needs to happen and people need to talk about it. But vacation is what's at stake and what's available to people that have records in terms of like drug charges with cannabis. With that happening, I think that anybody who's currently in the system needs to be released. There needs to be programs, job training, and incubators for people that are formerly incarcerated that have dealt with having this item as a part of their life as a career blocker to get into this industry. And you know, there are people that operate currently in the secondary market, people that operate previously in the secondary market that have honestly done a better job distributing this item than people that are currently doing now, right? Mm -hmm. They just happen to look like you and me or be melanated human beings. With that being said, providing a pathway for someone to want to go legit should be something on everybody's mind. To just keep that system going and find a way to criminalize people again when it goes legal is definitely a way. And it feels like it's definitely on purpose to keep people that are black and brown and otherwise locked up in the system. Mm -hmm. So for you, you're a cannabis marketer and you're the co-creator of Canaclusive. Yes. For somebody who doesn't know about Canaclusive, let us know. Canaclusive is a marketing, it is an inclusion-based marketing and business advocacy group. It's a collective founded by three black women, Tanya Rapley and Charlize Antoinette and myself. We're a team of seven black women, uh, two Afro-Lapina, one woman who survived and beat cancer twice with the plant, uh, and an individual from Louisiana who moved to California. Uh, we're between two different states, New York and California right now. We do events, we do education platforms and processing on what it means to be in this industry. We do visuals and we do marketing for different brands that are women owned and POC focused on how to present themselves as far as like digital, online and in-person media. And we also do business advocacy. So we care about the policies that are being put together in place to advocate for equity. And given our insights and experiences, given my background in tech, diversity, inclusion, advertising, politics, and even like community organizing from when I was in college up until the age I am now, and our backgrounds mixed between finance, creative direction, design, media, politics, and just overall event and development, we want to create experiences that talk about and profile people that exist in this industry that are melanated. Mm -hmm. We exist, we're here, and one of the big things that happens is that politicians don't know that people like you and me even think about this industry in that way or that we're even already in it from an ancillary business side 
from a plant touching side. Mm -hmm. That needs to be lifted up and we can't wait on media to pick up those stories because we're gonna be waiting forever. What's it like when you interact with politicians? You talked about that interaction, right? So, you know, I mean, I, I know there's some just basic general stereotypes. Of, oh, 100%. Oh, here, come, here comes the marijuana lady. Well, no one even knows that I am the marijuana lady. The way that I present myself and the way that I look, their idea of what marijuana looks like is so stigmatized and rooted in stereotypes that when they meet me and hear me, hear me speak, they're like, wait, you use cannabis? And I'm like, yes. And yeah, straight went up. to University of Michigan. Uh, too, I went to right? U of M. And I'm, you know, but I mean, like, let's talk about it, right? So from a politician that's non black, it's rooted in microaggressions. How did you know about this? How did you get into school? Wow, you speak so well. Wow, I didn't know someone so pretty like you would even be this smart. There's that from politicians that are melanated. Well, what do you mean about this? Well, you're just perpetuating a stereotype or I didn't know any of this existed or you know, I can't believe you would even work in this or how would you make money in that? All of this is just rooted in bad stigma and no idea of what the industry looks like. So I'm the, it's important for me to have very well understanding of decorum of what that is. If I'm gonna be the first person that engages with someone, I want them to know that, yes, this is a business. Yes, there are opportunities here. If you want to talk about cannabis stocks and all of that stuff, fine. You can pay a consulting fee and we can go there. But there's advocacy and there's policy that can match to make sure that the community that you serve, if you're melanated, if you're black, Puerto Rican, Cuban, any of that nature, given downstate or upstate, your communities need this. And you should care about this because when people are having their records sealed or the potential for expungement, and they're released, and they're coming back into the field with no jobs, what are you gonna say? Why would you not provide that? Why would you not figure out job training and incubation so that everyday citizens, whether they're black, white, or candy stripe, that come out of the system or already exist in the community can participate in the industry? There are ancillary businesses that are operating that have nothing to do with owning a dispensary or a cultivation. Having that ability to even finance that takes, at minimum, $5 million of private money. You can't go to the bank, you can't get a grant, you can't get a loan. Mm -hmm. So if we're only thinking about the idea of the glamorization of dispensaries, understand that dispensaries open and close every day because they can't keep open. And it's not because they're black owned. 81% are owned by white men. So let's be clear, that's a very high risk business to where it takes a lot of continual financing to make sure that you're in good shape. There are news stories every day about major VCs that are losing money or major marijuana groups or groups that do cannabis business as far as the plant touching side like MedMen that are having financial issues. Mm -hmm. So if you're MedMen and you're having financial issues and you're Joe Schmo with your $10 million investment of a dispensary and you can't keep business going and you can't get clones to your business, you can't find ways to do marketing to your business because you can't have online media being paid for by it because it's a federal regulated drug, you're running into issues. Mm -hmm. So people have to understand those realities about one, you're not gonna have that opportunity unless you already have experience in that industry already. And two, that capital issue is a real issue that affects everybody, given how much it's really needed. Let's take a quick break and come back. We talked about the criminalization of marijuana, decriminalization of marijuana, but we're gonna talk about investment right after this. Marcus, please. <laughs> retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, but now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org.
And we are back here on Perspectives. Our guest is Studio Mary Pryor, and she's a cannabis marketer and co-creator of Can Inclusive and being sure a little bit about uh, cannabis, marijuana. We talked about criminalization. We talked about decriminalization. And I, I started before we went to the break talking about, you know, investment because many people don't talk about the investment side mm -hmm. of cannabis this, uh, uh, today, and it is a lucrative business. It is, it is. I think that there's two, there's many ways to look at it, but I can kind of like overarch on two. So there's taking money that you have as an accredited investor, which means you have to have a net wealth of, you want to have to prove your net wealth and be approved to do so on the accredited side to be able to invest on that level. And then there's unaccredited investor, which is a person who would not fit into that bubble. But with that being said, you have people that are making investments and then to stocks, which is still a long game, and businesses, which is still a long game. So for people that are looking for like, you know, I can short sell, put my money in, put my money out, like cannabis doesn't want, run like that. So for example, I'm part of a group, we're turning into a, a nonprofit grant uh, that we're kind of like seeking out and figuring out from a VC model of what's possible with that. But we've already invested in dispensaries. And with that being said, we're waiting for that to even be secured, to even kick off. That turnaround time is like probably three to five years. So that's still something that is going to take time to like materialize or build. Right. Uh, if you're doing stocks, depending upon what you're getting into, you have to be able to operate and look at your money every day in every way, shape and form. I wake up at 5 a.m. every day to check out what's happening overseas before it hits the 7 a.m. bell in New York. When I lived in California, I was waking up at 3.30 a.m. to check what was going on for 7 a.m. here. Mm -hmm. That means that 4 a.m. is 7 a.m. and L like that's how you have to operate with watching how everything moves. And it needs to become a, a part of your daily consumption diet of what you look into as a human being. So if you're not about that life to understand how things are moving, me talking about a hemp stock or a cannabis stock doesn't really matter. It really does take a, a willingness to be financially educated before you even get into that to understand how that game really works. Because every news story, every release, every insight document, all those items play into how people evaluate or buy into a stock mm -hmm. to raise up its value. So just knowing those trends and being early can allow you to make a decision where you're making money or you're losing money or you're selling before you lose. When did you become so passionate about cannabis? I think for me, I mean, I was a recreational user in high school and college, but I never really made it a thing. Uh, and it wasn't until t really I was diagnosed with a chronic illness in 2013, which completely shaped and turned my life around. And it wasn't until 2015 where I had to manage that on top of a parent that was transitioning and passing on, I started looking at this way more medicinally, looking at which properties of the plant, which has over, there are over 100 cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. It's not just about getting high or just like, let me get that sour diesel or that purple haze, but there are over a thousand strains. On top of that, over 100 di different parts of the plant. So there's like your THC, which you hear about, but then there's your THCA, your THCV, your CBD, your CBDG, your CBDN, your CBCC, like, there are parts of that that actually do something different if you extract it or use it. So I started researching strains that gave me the relief that I needed, which was inflammation and pain mm -hmm. and anxiety. So I used certain strains for that. And for my transitioning parent, who was my mother, I was giving her cannabis because fentanyl, dilated, and morphine wasn't working. She was in hospice and she couldn't even sleep. She was in so much pain, she couldn't even pass away. Mm -hmm. So for two whole weeks, I was going between another city and in my home city giving her cannabis and then my mother being very proud of being able to have relief told other people about it and but I ended up dealing with six other families that were like I need this for my mom I need this for my dad and for me it's my mother so you know I don't give 
a darn what anybody would say about what I could not do or should not do for my mom, but seeing that what it allowed her to do to be able to eat and be able to have no pain in her last days, that meant everything for me. So, and seeing that with other people completely changed my entire eye around the plant. So now I have people that I work with privately that have cancer, have endometriosis, have severe anxiety, have severe pain, have issues with digestive systems, have really bad headaches, have really bad issues in terms of like post-recovery care for surgeries. I help them figure out which strains they can get access to and use. And even people that are, you know, terminally ill and they need this just to be able to get through the next day until that time changes. Uh, take a quick break, come back with more with Mary right after this here on Perspectives. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. I did. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. It's totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that strollers have the right of way on the sidewalk? Yes. Yep, I did. Did you guys Did know? you know that kids who eat breakfast have higher GPAs? Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to say. Did you know babies should never touch silver? It's really bad for them. I knew that. Did you guys know that statistically friendly kids have more friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. I'm putting that on my blog. I just put it in mine. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. But I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Okay, back here on Perspectives. Darren Jaime here with you. And uh, share that again. We were just talking off camera. <laughs> no, nah, girl, you're not going to do that to me. <laughs> we won't have this conversation off camera. <laughs> I was like, you're going to fall off my chair. <laughs> Say that again. So for me, my personal story, um, I, during Hurricane Sandy, I was training for a, a fitness show. So I was doing like competitive fitness bodybuilding and I was training for a fitness show and literally one day I was in a comedy club with my friends and then the next day I was vomiting up blood and I was bleeding out of my body. And I ended up in, the, in NYU for almost a month. Hurricane Sandy hit, I had to get the hospital shut down, the lights went out, I had to get carried out on a stretcher down 26 flights of stairs. Then I was at Lenox Hill. Then they didn't know what was going on. I was in hospital five more times before that. Then February 2013 of that year, I went into shock and they had to put me in a coma to pull my body down and I was in ICU. That's when I got my diagnosis for Crohn's. From there, between that time and 2015, I was in hospital over 30 times. Um, and I was having flares, which were, a flare is where your in, intestines collapse and deteriorate and you just bleed out blood. So I was literally operating with like, I was getting blood transfusions, IR transfusions, biologic transfusions all the time. And I was on Dilaudid, Percocet, everything. I had 21 medications I'd take a day and it was not working. Um, I almost, I didn't really eat, any, I was afraid to eat. So I got down, I got dropped down to 119 pounds my first year. Um, and at the same time, my mother had MS and lupus and colitis, and she had a lot of mental instabilities, but I was her. I was taking care of myself and trying to take care of her. And I had a god sister who was managing that back home, but literally I wasn't able to work because my medication, like you can't work on those medications. Mm -hmm. So, when my mother, when things were definitely like aiming towards that transition, I was back home between working a major project for a tech client in New York and managing my health and going to Denver and going to Detroit. And I was literally bringing stuff back from Denver to Detroit for me and my mom. And so honestly, when I started really understanding the science and applying it, 
I've been in the hospital two more times since then, and that's it. Just twice? Just twice. Since you've been using? Yes. Like, more medically, yes. Right. And I use every day in different ways. I use different extractions from CBD mostly to, like, if I can use items that have more CBG or CBC or, like, CBN. Um, I mostly consume CBD flour now. Um, it's even something that we sell at a store that I work with called Comeback Daily, which is in Harlem and also in Tribeca. But honestly, without this, I would definitely not be here. Mm. And I tried to not be here at one point. Really? Yes, definitely. Wow. And so, what you, so your message today is what? My message today is don't judge a book by its cover. Everybody I know that's really a serious advocate in this space from the business level, from students uh, to even like grown-ups, we're in this because we know this plan has transformed and has changed our ability to even thrive. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about being able to smoke weed for me. As a matter of fact, I don't even like being high, mm -hmm. right? But I know different ways of what to use to be able to still do what I need to do throughout my day. And I'm about my business and I'm about making sure that we have a place to be at this table. Because if we don't get active now, we will be very left behind. And this is going to be the last chance for generational wealth, 100%. And as far as also speaking with elected officials and getting them on board, how active, uh, you know, what do you see this thing happening? Talk to your pastors, talk to your clergy, talk to your city councilman, your assembly person, your senator, your congressperson. You need to let them know that you want this and you want to talk about it and you want to make sure that our communities can have reinvestment from the taxes that are happening in this state. If we do not ask for that, given how you hear about all these states like Colorado having $140 million or California making money or Nevada making money, none of that money is going back into the communities mm -hmm. at all. So that's not a, a winning scenario because, trust me, we're not benefiting from it at all. So long state. story short, is legalizing is, is okay if there's going to be a reinvestment, but if there's not going to be a reinvestment... Oh, no, be... both needs to happen. Right. The thing is this, and this is me being woke, no government program has ever helped people of color. Right. So I don't look for that. I'm just being honest with you. Right. No government program has helped the progression of black and brown people. So with that being said, unite your block, hit up your street dealers, tell them you want to figure this out, make an LLC and do both. You can make an LLC and start investing. You can talk to your local street pharmacist and let them know, like, yo, like, let's shape this up. Do not get left behind in this business. Do not wait for the government to tell you what to do. You can get active in this. You can find ways to put money together as families. You can knock on the doors in your building. You can figure this out. But if you're waiting on the government to give you a way in, good, but that hasn't happened yet, and don't wait for it. All right, Mary Pryor, we've got to end it there. Thank you for coming. Got to come you. back. All right, Mary Pryor, guest here on Perspectives. Listen, you had our information at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions or comments, listen, feel free to email her. Feel free to email us. Talk to us here at the show. But, you know, that's why we have Perspectives, because, you know, you never know. It just might make a difference in somebody else's life. Today, I learned a few things. I'm sure you did too. So next time we meet, Darren Harmon saying take care. God bless. See you soon. Perspective, you found your light. Cause it might make a difference in someone else's life.